When I was in high school, I was driving somewhere. I don't remember where. It was on Midway Road. Midway Road had a lot of curves and hills on it. And my 1994 Pontiac Grand Prix with four doors. Loved to go up and down and over those hills. It was 40 miles an hour on that road. But to 16, 17 year old Travis, it was like way more. And I remember coming over a hill and there was a car in front of me that was going way faster than me. And so they went over the hill and I thought to myself, well shoot, if he's going so fast, they're gonna catch him rather than me. So police officer was going the other direction. He whipped around and I saw lights behind me and I thought, well, he's trying to go after that other guy. I'm gonna pull over and help justice be served. Justice came and found me that day. He pulled me over and I rolled down my window and he said, do you know how fast you were going? And I told him how fast I was going. There was no point in denying it. And he said, well, I wanted to get the guy that was in front of you because he was going way faster, but I couldn't because you were going so fast. And my sense of justice was offended and, and very upset. Clearly I've held on to it for, you know, 25 years. But I was obviously very defenseless. I had no leg to stand on. I couldn't offer up a case. I couldn't say something ridiculous like, I was trying to do a citizen's arrest. I was going after that guy too. I had nothing. And I don't know if you've ever been in a position like that where you've been caught red-handed, you've been exposed, you've been vulnerable, and there's nothing you can say. There's nothing you can do. And you just have to let the accusations come and hope that there's mercy, hope that there's grace, hope that the person or the people that you've hurt or the people that have been wronged can find it in their hearts to forgive you. Or maybe it's an unjust accusation, but you still, you can't explain yourself. You, you can say, I, I see how this looks, but I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't quite put it into words. It's hard when you're defenseless. It's difficult when you don't feel like you have a leg to stand on. And so we're gonna to talk today about what it means to be defended by our advocate, Jesus Christ. We're gonna be in Luke chapter 23, verses one to five. And then we're gonna jump over to John 18. It'll be the same story, just uh, different tellings. And I want us to talk about today how Jesus' death and his resurrection defends us we're in our, when we're in a powerless state. And that death and resurrection defends us from a great deal, but we're going to focus on three of those things today. And the first one is that we are defended from accusation. We're defended from accusation, verse 1 of chapter 23. And then the whole company of them, this is the Sanhedrin, arose and brought him before Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this man misleading our nation and forbidding us to give tribute to Caesar and saying that he himself is Christ, a king. And Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, You've said so. And then Pilate said to the chief priests and the crowds, I find no guilt in this man. But they were urgent, saying, He stirs up the people, teaching him throughout all Judea, even from Galilee to this place. So the Sanhedrin's finished their religious trials. They're now moving into the fourth trial that Jesus goes through. And this is what our sermon series is focusing on, the trials of Jesus. And so this is his first civil trial, his fourth trial overall. And he goes before a man named Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate was a Roman, a Roman governor. So when Herod the Great died, who was in charge of all of Palestine when Jesus was born, his kingdom was divided amongst some of his sons, and one of his sons who had Judea didn't last very long. He wasn't very good at his job. And so the Roman government put a governor over that region. There were some other guys that came before, but Pontius Pilate was the longest serving governor. And he lives in a place called Caesarea Maritima, or Maritima. I don't do Latin, but that's what it is. And in, at Jewish festivals and at celebrations, he would come into Jerusalem to make sure that things didn't get out of hand. So he's in Jerusalem at this time, and Pilate is not a nice man. The Gospels kind of paint Pilate, depending on who you read, either as a sympathetic figure or somebody who was just being used by uh, evil people. No, 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 no. Pilate's a bad guy. 
Pilate's a very bad man. At one point, he slaughters a bunch of uh, Jews and mixes their blood with their sacrifice. He is ruthless. He refuses to try and understand the Jewish religion. He is oppressive and he's stubborn. We're going to see some of that today. And so they brought charges against Jesus. And these are charges that the Jews don't care anything about. The Jews only care about the fact that Jesus claimed to be the Son of God. Outside of that, they don't care at all. But Rome doesn't care that he claims to be the Son of God. That doesn't bother them. So they've cooked up some charges that Rome will get very upset about. The first one they mention is that he's misleading the people. If you read in our dwell readings, as Keith was talking about, if you read those this week, you see that Jesus, on his way to Jerusalem, sends 72 people, 72 uh, messengers ahead of him. And this collects for him a massive following, streaming into Jerusalem with him. And Rome would have been very aware of this following. They would have, anybody that was that charismatic, that had that much control, would have been a threat. On top of that, Jesus is saying, you don't need to pay taxes. Well, we know that's not true. They're probably taking that teaching of render to Caesar what is Caesar's and twisting it just a little bit. And then lastly, they say he claimed to be a Christ, a king. They explain to Pilate what that is. There's no king but Caesar, according to Pilate. So this would have been the biggest threat. This would have been the biggest charge against him. So Pilate interviews him and says, hey, are you a king? Jesus answers, well, you've said so. That's the way you put it. Pilate goes back out to the the Sanhedrin and says, look, this guy's not guilty of anything that I really care to deal with. Again, Pilate is not being merciful. This is Pilate being like, I don't want to deal with this. And they are so vehement, they're so uh, 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 insistent that Jesus has done wrong that they actually uh, uh, push Pilate. It overrides Pilate's sense of logic, his sense of justice, his emotions. And you know how accusations like this can get when people believe so intently, when people are so angry, when people are so hurt. They can take something very small that might have some truth in it and explode it out into something that's way bigger. And when you're on the object of that accusation, when you're attacked like that, you can feel disarmed. You can be like, where did that come from? Maybe you've been at a Thanksgiving dinner where somebody just blew up. It's great because it gives you something to talk about on the way home. Like, man, did you see Uncle Bob just go off? The thing is, these accusations against Jesus are based in truth. Is he leading the people? Yes. Is he misleading them? No. Is he the Christ? Yes. Did he talk about taxes? Yes. Did he tell them to not pay them? No. Is he a king in the way they understand kings? No. Usually when we're accused, there's some nugget of truth in there. There's some kernel of truth in there. Sometimes accusations against us are very blunt and direct. You hurt my feelings. You said this. You forgot to do that. Sometimes it's a question. Did you forget to pick up the kids? Oh my gosh. Yes. Yes, I did. They're learning resiliency. They're fine. Sometimes it's hyperbole. It's it's, it's an exaggeration. Did you eat all of the ice cream? No, there is a scoop still here in the cart. I didn't eat all of it. I started at half. There is a scoop. You always say that. I don't always say that. You never remember these things. Remember some of them. Accusations are difficult to defend against. I want us to see how Jesus defends himself here. He does two things. The first thing he does is that he's silent. He's silent. He doesn't try to over, talk over his accusers. He doesn't try to address them. He doesn't try to defend himself. Nothing. Now, I hope you have, uh, know Jesus well enough at this point to know that Jesus is rarely ever just silent. I have a hard time believing that at the end of the Garden of Gethsemane, all the way up to the cross, Jesus never prays. I have a hard time believing he's just sitting there being like, all right, you know, I've got to get this on. Yeah, this is how this is supposed to work. All right. I think Jesus is in prayer still. I think he is speaking with his father. 
I think he's praying that they would, that, that God would strengthen him. I think he's praying that God would help him uh, to uh, absorb this. I pray that, I think that he's praying that, that God would forgive his accusers. We know he prays for forgiveness for his accusers later on. I think Jesus is praying. He's silent, but he's not silent. When you are accused, do not rush to defend yourself. Rush instead to the throne of God. Plead your case there in the highest court. Say, Lord Jesus, hear what they're saying about me. And he'll say, I know they said things like that about me too. Jesus, some of it's true. Yeah. And that's the other thing we have to do. You've got to admit the truth. You've got to admit the truth. That's what Jesus does. When Pilate says, you're a king, he's like, yeah, you can say that. It's not the way you understand kingship, but yes. When we're, when we're accused, we have to admit the truth. We've got to own up to the truth of things. When somebody says, you always do that, or you never do that, be like, oh, okay. That is a fair accusation in that it is a regular problem that I have to do this, that, or the other. But let's, let's be honest about what's going on. Own up to the truth. Any follower of Jesus should always be on the side of truth, even if it indicts themselves, even if it gets them into trouble. Be on the side of truth. So we're silent and we're truthful. But if Jesus is just your example when accusations come, it's going to be very little help to you. Because the two greatest accusers that you have can't be handled like that. That doesn't work like this. Because the two greatest accusers that you have come against you are Satan and your own conscience. Satan and your own conscience. And what happens is Satan, his name literally means accuser. His job, his joy is to stand before the throne of God and say, look what they've done. Look how they rebel against you. They deserve death. Destroy them. Get rid of them. And our consciences often chime in with him, right? Well, God, he's right. I do rebel against you. I, I, I am kind of mean. I am kind of cruel. I am lustful. I am this. I am that. And what happens is our natural tendency, because we love to defend ourselves so much, is to rise to the occasion, to defend ourselves in the same way we try to defend ourselves against people. We say, well, God, you know what? That may have happened, but look, I did the dwell readings this week, and I, I prayed like three times outside of food times, and I went to church this Sunday, and I went to Connect Group. And have you heard that guy teach? That's a joke. I'm sure you're all wonderful teachers. Jesus, look at all the good stuff I've done, and this is a cardinal mistake that you make. Because how insane would it be for me to walk into a courtroom where I'm on trial and just start talking and be like, hold on a second, judge, let me tell you about all the good things I've done. Yes, officer, I was speeding on Midway Road, but let me tell you about all the good things that I've done this week. That's not how the courts work, y'all. That's not how they work. You don't understand, if you do that, and I'm not a lawyer, but you don't understand the jurisprudence that goes on inside the courtroom. And to go into the courtroom of God and say, God, look at all this great stuff I've done. You're out of order. You don't understand how the courtroom of heaven works. But you have an advocate that does. If we had a lawyer on retainer, how silly would it be for us to take our own cases and try them ourselves? What a waste of money. You have a, a lawyer on retainer who's bought with his own blood. And we choose to just try and handle things ourselves. What you must do is the exact same thing that I said to do earlier. Be silent. Trust your lawyer, Jesus Christ, who died for you. And admit to the truth. Go to him and be like, Lord Jesus, what they're saying is true. What my conscience says is true. But because of you... I am made right because of you, I'm forgiven. Not anything that I've done. Will you defend me? And he says, yes, I will defend you. I will defend you. But oftentimes these accusations that come against us, like I said, we try to defend ourselves. And when that doesn't work, we try to look the part. We try to look innocent. We don't want to look guilty. And this is another thing we need to be defended against. Hypocrisy. We are defended from hypocrisy. Look at John 18. John 18, it'll be up on the screen as well. 
John 18, 28 says, Then they led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to the governor's headquarters. It was early morning. They themselves did not enter the governor's headquarters so that they would not be defiled, but could eat the Passover. And so Pilate went outside to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? And they answered him, If this man were not doing evil, we would not have delivered him over to you. And Pilate said to him, said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. And the Jews said to him, it is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill the word that Jesus had spoken to show by what kind of death he was going to die. So there's a little bit of political intrigue going on here. I read one commentator that says that the Sanhedrin had already worked out a deal with Pilate saying, hey, we're going to bring you somebody. We just need you to pronounce death on him. And Pilate may have even sent some soldiers with the, with the Sanhedrin to make sure the arrest went down smoothly. And so when they show up and they say, hey, this is the guy, Pilate does something unexpected. He says, what's, his, what's your accusation against him? And they're like, y'all, we, we, Pilate, we went over this. And Pilate's doing a little bit of a power play here. He's like, no, we're going to follow procedure. You're going to have to answer to me. And when they get frustrated with him, he says, well, you guys go and try him yourselves. And he makes them admit that they need him. Again, stubborn, petty Pilate. But I want you to see the hypocrisy going on on the Sanhedrin's part here. First, they don't want to be defiled by entering into a Gentile's home. They want to be able to eat the Passover. So apparently, entering into a Gentile's home will defile you, but lying about an innocent man and having him killed, you're good. You can eat the Passover. Secondly, they're talking about Jesus. Remember the accusations that were leveled against him in Luke. Those are the same ones leveled here. It's the same trial. Misleading the people, refusing to pay taxes, claiming to be a king. Get rid of Caesar. Those are all the things the Sanhedrin wants. They want their own kingdom. They want to get rid of the king. They want to get rid of Caesar. They don't want the people to pay taxes. And they're misleading the people against Rome and against God. And this is hypocrisy. Doing one thing, looking like one thing, when inside or behind closed doors, you are something else. Hypocrisy is a defense mechanism. We are afraid to be exposed, we're afraid to be vulnerable, and so we put on this armor of looking a part. You ever see chameleons, stick bugs, animals that function with camouflage? Hypocrisy is a form of camouflage. But I don't think we think about, one, why? What damage does it do to me to be a hypocrite? I don't think we think about that at all, and I don't think why we're susceptible to it. Let's talk about what damage it does first. I was listening to a sermon this week by an early 20th century preacher named, named Gerhardus Voss. He's Dutch. And uh, he talked about how young people, young adults, teenagers, kids are so stinking optimistic all the time. And I really wish I could say that we as young adults are optimistic, but I can't say we. You, young adults, are optimistic. I'm not in the category anymore. And he says one of the reasons why you're optimistic is because most young adults think the best is yet to come. Good days are ahead of us. We have a lot to look forward to. Whereas those of us who are older start looking backwards and thinking our best days are behind us. The good times happened before. And what hypocrisy does to us, the damage that it does, is it makes us long to have short-term good days ahead of us. We want real, tangible, good days. So we trade, we mortgage the eternal hope of God that we have, not in a salvation sense, but in an efficacious sense. The effectiveness that having hope in Jesus does for us, the way it helps us live and serve and rely on him. We mortgage that for the short-term benefits of things like people thinking well of us, success, material gains and possessions, leaving a legacy, having a picture-perfect family. And we keep trading on it and trading on it. We think hope and happiness are found in those things. And we mortgage it against the eternal hope that we have in Christ. And then what happens? Well, then the debts come calling. Debts like cancer and rebellion. Rebellious kids, divorce, loneliness. And you find that those short-term hopes aren't good enough to cover those big-time debts. Only the hope of Christ can do that. But you've mortgaged it, you've bankrupt, you despair. Saw on the news this week about a couple of banks, three banks, whatever, having some problems. 
I'm going to put that mildly, mostly because I don't understand banking. But I know that because of the Great Depression, the government has come in and guarantees certain investments, certain savings up to a certain amount of money. And when you find out that your hope is despairing, you have to go to Christ and say, God, I'm bankrupt. And Jesus says, I know. But if you are in Christ, you're like a bank that's a member of FDIC, right? I know the commercials, member of FDIC, right? They, they say that after every commercial. You want your investments to be covered, protected. And Jesus does that. He protects us. He defends us from the bad investment of hypocrisy. And he'll restore our hope to us if we'll go to him. But why, do we, why are we so susceptible to it? Why do I want to be a hypocrite? We all hate hypocrites. We talk about them terribly. We don't want to be labeled a hypocrite. Why do I do it? I'll tell you why. It happens to me when my desire and affection and love for Christ grows cold. John Owen says this, he says, when someone is content, the key word is content, with lifeless performance of worship without delight, joy, or satisfaction to his soul. Again, when you're content. Sometimes we go to church on Sunday and we're just not feeling it. Sometimes that happens for weeks or months on end. Sometimes we don't want to be in the Word. Sometimes we, we don't want to pray. Sometimes we just don't feel it. And that's normal, y'all. It is perfectly normal. Most people do not burn white hot for Jesus 24-7. I hope that you do. But what happens is many of us are just content to stay in the lukewarm pursuit of Jesus. We think lukewarm is good enough, and that's the problem. That's where hypocrisy sets in. Because what happens is your, your external responsibilities as a Christian don't dwindle to the same degree as the flame in your heart has dwindled. And so you still have to act like a Christian for the sake of your family, for the sake of your job, for the sake of your church. And that's when we become hypocrites. Behind the walls, inside the closed doors of our heart, maybe even in our own home, the flame that burned hot now burns cold. So how do we combat this? You have to spend time with the one person who is never a hypocrite. You have to spend time with Jesus. You have to go to him and let him rekindle that flame for you. Jesus was never a hypocrite. He was consistent inside and out. When your relationship with a significant other grows cold, typically we try to go on dates, we try to salvage it, we go on marriage retreats. So it is with Christ. We must spend time with him. Do the dwell readings, be in prayer. And you might say, hey, the dwell readings, that's just checking a box. Sometimes checking a box is all you can do when life is throwing its stuff at you. Maybe we should have some faith that God can take, if God can take five loaves and two fish and make a feast, I bet he can take a, a passage read for checking a box and make it a feast for your soul. Owen talks about how, uh, he says, I neglected private prayer. I did not meditate on the word nor attend to hearing, but rather despised these things and yet said I was rich and wanted nothing. You've got to spend time with Jesus. On the other hand, tear down the false image of what you're trying to project. When people ask for prayer requests, don't be like, yeah, we're good, we're fine. No. I'm cold towards Christ right now. I do not desire him. That is a worthy prayer request. Worthy prayer request. But like in following Jesus, all things have to be about him. And so we have to go to him. We have to tell him with the last burning embers of that flame, Lord Jesus, the fire is going out. And he says, I know we're going to get it going again. I'm going to get it going again. And this is what the Sanhedrin couldn't do. Their fire had long been cold. But they refused to go to the one who could set it ablaze again. They refused to submit to him, and instead, they kill him. But many of us do not live the examined life. Many of us live in such a way that we hear, oh, hypocrisy, that's somebody else. I'm pretty consistent. And that's the third thing you need to be defended from, deception. We are defended from deception. Verse 38 Sorry, verse 33. So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? And Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered over, you over to me. What have you done? 
And Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. And then Pilate said to him, so you are a king. And Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. And Pilate said to him, what is truth? Pilate flippantly asks him, are you the king of the Jews? And I think Jesus sees something here. I think Jesus is, is, I don't know if hoping is the right word. Jesus is giving Pilate the opportunity to become somebody like Zacchaeus or like Nicodemus or like Joseph of Arimathea, somebody in a position of power who can relinquish their power and become a follower of his. And so Jesus asks him a question. Usually the judge asks the question. Jesus asks a question himself. And Pilate responds with another question. Am I a Jew? How could you be my king? I'm not even one of your people. And then you notice after that, Jesus just starts answering the questions. Because Pilate has rejected him. Jesus can't be his king. He can't see past the fact that Jesus is a Jewish rabbi. That's all he is. He's just a Jewish rabbi to Pilate. You see, what Pilate has done is Pilate is putting his trust in something. Pilate's trust is squarely in Rome. Pilate has been deceived by the centurions, by the aqueducts, by the roads, by the colonnades, by the emperor himself, in thinking that everything is about the empire. If I can serve the empire, if I can serve the emperor, I can do a good job, I can get out of this awful place, Judea, and I can go someplace important, and I can be somebody. And the sad thing is, Pilate utters the tragic words, what is truth? Pilate's truth is empty. And the reason why it's empty is he gets fired like three years after this because he has a, his soldiers attack a caravan of pilgrims, slaughtering them. And they, the ones that escape tell on him. And no one know what happens to Pilate after that. He was deceived. He was misled. He was the most important man, most important Roman in Judea. And he's forgotten about He's fired. He gave his life to Rome, and Rome used him up and tossed him aside. It's a word of caution. How many of us find our hope and our joy and our satisfaction in those other things? How many of us have been deceived by success, by material possessions, by having the picture-perfect family, by having good relationships? And we think that's all we need. That's success. We've all been deceived. It started in the garden with a fruit. And ever since then, we've been chasing the next thing and the next thing and the next thing that's going to defend us, that's going to give us security, that's going to give us comfort, that's going to not let us feel exposed. We're left with Pilate with the implied question, what is truth? What is truth? I'll tell you what truth is. Truth is the word of Jesus. You see, we think truth is either honesty or we think it's, it's a fact. Truth is reality. Truth is reality. Truth is wh- wh- the way the world works. So uh, Isaac Newton discovered gravity, right? Until then, we were all just floating around. But he discovered gravity, and so we ver- planted our feet squarely on the earth. We'd all be in seat belts right now if it wasn't for Isaac Newton. Y'all know that's not true, right? I know the church gets a bad rap about not believing in science, but seriously, y'all, that, you know that's not true, right? Gravity was a fact then. It just hadn't been explained. Just because something, you don't understand something, just because it doesn't make sense, just because it doesn't seem to work the way the world works, doesn't mean it's not truth. Anything that Jesus says, anything Jesus is, anything scripture say about Jesus, that is the truth. And so we forgive people because Jesus says to. We apologize and seek forgiveness and confess because Jesus says to. We give beyond the means that we're comfortable giving because Jesus says to. We sacrifice for each other because Jesus says to. And the world says no. Greed and vengeance and stubbornness and productivity, those are the, that's reality. No, that's deception. And I know some of you are sitting here thinking, Travis, you work at a church. You don't know how, it's, how it is out there. Forgiveness and mercy might work here, but it doesn't work out there. Well, guess what? You've been deceived. 
Because yeah, vengeance and stubbornness might be the way to survive out there, but it's not the way to thrive. The way to thrive is through love and compassion and mercy, through following not just the teachings of Jesus and not just the example of Jesus, but trusting him to cover you even when those things seem to fail. What did we sing? We sang about do not fear the one who can kill the body because Christ's word endures. The truth endures. Will you give your life to him? If you've never done that, will you, will you recognize that his death, his burial, his resurrection is there to defend you, to defend you from accusations you have no hope of defending, to defend you from this temptation we have to, to chameleon into a hypocrite, and to defend you from all the lies that are out there. It is Christ and Christ alone. He's the only one who can defend you. Otherwise, you're left to your own defi- devices and you might as well be defenseless. If you have come to Christ, then you've got a lawyer on retainer. And he's the best there is. You need to go to him. You spend time with him. You need him far more than you think you do. Give him your life. Trust him. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, thank you that you have defended us, that you've protected us. Even in giving us breath, allowing our bodies to work, you give us protection. But Lord God, there is a greater need that we have. We need a champion. One who can walk into the valley like David walked and slay the greatest giant we face, which is our own evil. Lord Jesus, please defend us. And maybe more than that, let us know of our helplessness. Let us know of our defenselessness. And let us turn to you in that time. For you're our only hope. Jesus.